we're going to talk about the Baroque art movement. Baroque simply means uh, an irregular shaped pearl. That, that's a, a, and that's translated from the Portuguese. Now, how that got in there, I have no clue, but that's the name that stuck. So we're talking about Baroque today. And the Baroque period was from roughly 1600 to 1725. It's, uh, it's, I call it the dark heart of art. And also the other title could be in your face art. And uh, if we bring up our first slide, we will see immediately what I'm talking about. This is a Caravaggio painting, uh, and uh, this is the crucifixion of St. Peter. And uh, as you can see, this is a very scary looking painting, and it's a huge painting as well. So if you were in, say, 1500, and you walked up to this painting, you would think, Oh my gosh, it would frighten you. And that's what it's meant to do. There is, uh, the next slide is also representative. Uh, this is the chopping off of uh, Holofrenes' head uh, by Judith. And uh, this is by our first famous woman artist, so I'm very proud to show her work today. And as you can see, her work is exemplary. Uh, this, the art that we want to talk about today is really meant to scare the pants off of you. Uh, as the Renaissance ended, as you all know, the church was in extreme power at that time. I had no, it, it, was, it was a totally irrational time to live in. I don't know how people made it through, and especially artists, because we're weird to begin with. But the, as the Renaissance ended, the church was trying to sort of keep up. So what they were doing is they were sort of changing the rules uh, of getting into heaven. They were, you know, a lot of people were challenging these rules because they, the church actually had little tokens that you could buy uh, called incentives. These incentives, if you donated a certain amount to the church, they would give you these little incentives. It's kind of like today's, um, the, a uh, uh, gift with purchase, I guess you could say. But anyway, they were very, they were very real and uh, they could be purchased. So as an ex there were a lot of people that were taking issue with this kind of stuff because remember the printing press had just been invented and a lot was being printed. And a lot of people were learning to read. And a lot of people were thinking for themselves. And along about this time came a fellow by the name of Martin Luther. He was born in 1483. And he was a pretty smart fellow uh, in many ways. In other ways, he was sadly lacking, like the man was an anti-Semite. Uh, so you see, he had his issues as well. However, you know, everybody's not all good or all bad. So he made statements like, why doesn't the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest classes, build the Basilica of St. Peter with his own money rather than the money of the poor believers. Uh, so you could imagine artists worked at the direction of the church 
And the church was in a religious war for your soul and your money, um, just much like it is today. Uh, as far as art goes, you have to think about art in the following way. You're standing there in 1500 and you're looking at some of these pieces. This was a time of extremes in art. Uh, like you just saw the, the crucifying of St. Peter upside down. Well, I mean, that's a horror show in itself. Uh, in art, if you just then dissect the art itself, this was real or implied movement in art, if you think about that painting. And these were attempts to represent infinity. You know, that's the reason for these dark backgrounds. Uh, you don't know where you are or what's going on in addition to this. And there's an emphasis on light and its effects. And a focus, of course, on drama and real theatrics. Also at this time, individual thought brought about invention, intervention, discovery, the separation of church and state, capitalism and great art. This was also spreading all over Europe and the Spanish colony of Naples was busy applying this drama and passion and they also invented the opera at this time. So the art, the, this was art that pulled you in to show you that life is short and reality is really just an illusion. This art hunted you down and blurred the lines between reality and myth, as you see in front of you. Some of the most responsible artists at this time that lived between, remember we're talking about 1600 to 1725, were Caravaggio, Rubens, Gentileska, and Velazquez. These are just four. Uh, there are many more great artists that we just won't have time to cover at this time. But these artists changed things, both at the behest of the Catholic Church and through their own creative processes. Uh, can I have the slide of uh, Caravaggio, the portrait slide of Caravaggio? There we are. This is Caravaggio. This is uh, what, this was a, a self-portrait. Caravaggio was a very interesting case and I'm gonna tell you a lot about him this afternoon. But uh, right now I want to show you before, the next thing I want to show you is the difference visually between the kind of art that we're looking at in the Baroque period and the kind of art that we were looking at in the Renaissance. Now, take a look at both of these slides on your screen. You can, of course, everyone knows the Sistine Chapel, right? and what it looks like. But if you look at what that art, just look at what the art looks like. It's light, it has an attitude, it has fantasy in it. It's kind of like a, a Disneyland uh, movie. You know, it's sort of like a Disney movie. It has a lot of pretend in it. And when you look at it, you know that it's pretend. But if you look at the crucifying of St. Peter upside down here by Caravaggio, 
you are looking at something that's happening right now in your face and it's real. And these people are dressed in whatever was popular at the time. They could have walked off the street and you can see the, the pain in this man's face and it's real. It's an attempt to capture you with reality on a flat surface, which is an extraordinary feat when you start to think about it. And this is another thing that you should be looking at is the darkness in this Caravaggio canvas. The darkness almost becomes a character. You know, in many movies, there uh, a part of the the scenery or the the set, they almost become characters. I can't think of one at the moment. Maybe Bob can, but these are uh, these. Oh, I have. I can give you one, like um, the Star Starship Enterprise. That was a, a that prop or that environment was actually a character. If you look at the Caravaggio, you can see here that that environment and that darkness around these people is almost a character in itself. You perceive it as that. Whereas the Renaissance art, then the other slide, you know that you're you're looking at what you what you're looking at fantasy. So that's a really big definition of this period of art, because as I told you a little bit before, uh, we didn't we were the war the church was in a war for your money and your faith, and your uh, everything else. Caravaggio changed all of this. Uh, Car Caravaggio put aside this heavenly magnificence, the halos, he put aside the cherubs, the angels, and he placed his focus on real people and real emotions. He also changed the way he physically painted. Before this, great painters like Michelangelo would come up with what they would call a cartoon, which is something that we do like today, it would be what we would call a tracing. And his assistants would take this tracing on a paper or whatever they used, and they would make little dots, little holes all along the outlines of whatever was to be painted. Then they would go along pouncing with chalk to make an outline. Then they would begin to paint in the characters or whatever, and the master, being Michelangelo, would come along and paint the finished product. This is not at all the way Caravaggio worked. Caravaggio worked from live models. Uh, he, he, he used no uh, chalk outlines. He used nothing but just reality and he painted exactly what he saw. He would pose the models and he would paint the real live models. And uh, he got them out of taverns or off the street or wherever, if it was a live body, he could use it as a model and he did. And this was a great tool in blurring the lines between reality and fantasy or myth. And the church loved him. Uh, Caravaggio, Caravaggio had a terrible childhood. His parents died when he was about 
between 10 and 12 years old. He murdered a fellow over uh, who had been a former, former friend. He, was, he lived on the streets actually for a while and uh, did caricatures on the street, much like you see uh, artists in Paris today. He, he did that, they were doing that at that time. And that's what he did. And he got in a lot of fights and he would live wherever he could find a spot to lay down with his canvases, that's what he did. And he got into a, a fight with this fellow and he murdered him. He was convicted of the murder. And, uh, but the point about this murder that I've made, I've made some notes about this because I thought it was important. Uh, Caravaggio, as he faced death all his life, he knew what murder looked like. He knew the color of blood. He knew what deception looked like. As you can see, if you go in to look at his canvases, like the, the card players, and he knew about torture. It was all there, and the church gave him many commissions, and the church loved him for a time. Caravaggio really, I can't really tell you my own feelings about Caravaggio because to my way of thinking, he's, he's the best of all the masters, the great masters. Uh, I feel so indebted to who he was and what he was. And he was returning to Rome to receive a pardon from the Pope when the boat left with his paintings, but not him. He was uh, down somewhere near Malta and he was taking a, a boat back. Uh, he ran after the boat as he realized they had still had his paintings on board and he was gonna give the Pope one of these paintings. As a result, he ran through the mosquito infested marshes, screaming after the boat, my paintings, my paintings, my, you have my paintings. But he caught malaria after he ran through these mosquito infested marshes along the shore. And he died of a fever in a local small hospital in 1610. And no one ever, no one really even knows where he's buried to this day. They have no real uh, beat on uh, where he's buried. However, every serious artist from then until this day stands on his shoulders and stands on the shoulders of this troubled, brilliant, courageous, interesting man. And he's called the most modern of all the great masters. Caravaggio was 39 years old when he died. So that, you know, it, it, it just, it's a tragic story, but it left such influence on what we do that, you know, you, it shows you just never know how important things are. The next artist that we're gonna cover is Peter Paul Rubens. This is Peter Paul Rubens and his wife. This is his first wife. Yes, he was madly in love with this woman. As a matter of fact, Peter Paul Rubens was in love with most of everything, I think. As dark as Caravaggio's life was, Peter Paul Rubens' life 
was as light filled with happiness and uh, uh, art and a loving family. Peter Paul Rubens painted intimacy and tenderness like no one before or since. I have a sketch that a friend brought back to me of his from Vienna, and I want to show it to you. I'm going to pull it up close to the camera, and I want you to just take a look at the, I hope you can, hope you can see it, and take a look at the wonderful detail. This is a pencil sketch. I mean, it's astonishing. Let me see if I can get it. There, I think I've got it. Take a look at that. It's just amazing. Now, this is the same woman that's in the painting that I just brought up. So this is obviously a print that they sell in Vienna today, but it's, it's a wonderful print because it shows the energy in his work and how, how he carefully and lightly and with heart renders every line that he puts down. He knows exactly where he's gonna put this line down before he ever hits the paper. Um, the, um, as I said, Rubens was a part of a large and loving family as a small child. His young experiences of courtly life and royal circles were very useful to him. His mother uh, was um, some kind of a dignitary with the court already. So he already had interesting, good connections. And he was a very confident and he was very well educated, so he was very knowledgeable. He was, and he was very smooth with social protocol uh, of the times. So his patrons, if I can have the disembarking of the, there we are. Now, take a look at this painting. This painting, is extraordinary. The people that Rubens had, has painted in this painting are so, it's so crowded with so much. There are Greek gods, there are myths, there's a, a soldier that's come to welcome her, the, the queen off of the barge. They've given her, actually, if you notice, they've actually given her a red carpet to walk down, which I think is pretty funny. They're still doing this. And she's embarking, disembarking with her maids. And uh, it, it's like a whole festival. Well, Rubens did this as uh, um, trying to show the elevated lifestyle and the elevated demeanor of the royals. He also served as a sort of quasi-diplomat. And he had, a, as you can see in this painting, he had a great capacity to express human emotions. His paintings were crowded with figures involved in drama, and action to match. So can I have my next slide, my woman's next slide? Yes. So as you can see, Rubens could paint this disembarking uh, off of at Marseille, Marseille. But most important, and at the root of his work, as you can see, are these cute little fat babies. And he himself had eight babies and he loved all his babies. So this is just as important a painting 
as the one we just saw those, that was accepted by court. So the point being, this man could paint intimacy and tenderness, and also he could paint diplomacy and grandeur and drama and myth. So he, Peter Paul Rubens was quite an artist. Um, and he lived to be, I think he lived to be in his late 60s, I think, which was pretty good for that time period. Okay, now we're going to go to Artemis, Arte, and I, you know, I'm not Italian, I'm a Texan, so I'm going to tell you uh, my best pronunciation for this. And uh, her name is Artemisa Gentileschi. Uh, she's, of course, Italian. So if I could have my slide up of Artemisca, there she is. This woman is our first, first great woman artist that was a success of means. This woman was centuries ahead of her time. And she was, as I said, the first woman to achieve really great success. She followed Caravaggio. Her, her, as a matter of fact, her father was friends with Caravaggio. So you see a great influence on her works uh, in, she painted in the Caravaggio manner, in the method. She tried to learn everything she could from him. But that's where it ends. Now it gets interesting. This woman was raped uh, at the age of 17 by her tutor. She filed charges against him. He was convicted, but he was never punished because the Pope felt that her tutor was too important, uh, an artist, uh, to, uh, to, to put him in prison, so the Pope pardoned him. However, uh, Gentileska got her, her revenge as well, because throughout her life, she made revenge the subject of most of her pictures. And she painted with a different emotional outlook to, on her canvases. In other words, uh, where uh, she rejected the uh, depiction of woman as objects of the male gaze in paintings. And as you know, during the Renaissance, I mean, if you just think of Mary, you know, Mother Mary or Mary, Mary Magdalene, all those women that were in those Renaissance paintings, you see people looking up to them like this or whatever. I mean, they're objects. These women are not real women. But now, think of the next slide I'm going to show you, if I can. Okay, here we are. This is Gentileska's portrait of Olofrenes being beheaded. And you can see that it's taking both of these women to cut the head off of this brute. You've never seen women painted like that before this time. This is the first time women ever really put themselves, she put herself out uh, to show what reality really was. So she was really a champion. She, um, here's a quote, interestingly enough, that I wanted to read to you too. 
In most paintings, including Caravaggio's hallucinatory rendering, Judith as a, has a servant who waits to collect the head. So if you looked at, at a Caravaggio's painting of this same event, you'd see the servant standing off to the side with a basket. But Judith, uh, but Gentileschi makes the servant a strong young woman who actively participates in the killing. This does two things. It adds a savage realism. It would take two women to kill this brute. It also gives the scene a revolutionary implication. If you look at that, you think, what wonders Junaleski? What if women got together? Could we fight back against a world ruled by men? And as you know, at that time, women had absolutely no rights. Uh, this was painted in 1620, the painting you're looking at. That was about 400 years ago. And uh, as you all know, uh, we're still trying and without cutting off their heads. Well, for most of the time, we don't cut their heads off. So that's our first important woman painter. The last painter that we're going to talk about today is really, really important as well. As all of these four painters that I talk to you today are. And as if you remember, in the past programs, I've told you about how uh, art reflects culture of the time. And that's the reason it's very important. It's not just taking a snapshot or a photograph. It's much, much more important and much deeper than that. Uh, as evidenced by the canvases I've been showing you in today's program. The last artist we're going to talk about is Velasquez. Velasquez was born in 1599. Velasquez has been called by many, many people the, the grandest master of all times as an artist and as someone who changed painting. Velasquez was born during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. I'm sure we all know what the Spanish Inquisition was. It was a rational torture, persecution of Jews and Moors, Muslims. There was tremendous anti-Semitism in Spain and Naples during this time. People were brought in, and if you were Jewish, they could take your property, your children, your wife, and put you in prison or torture you until you decided that you were going to convert and become a Christian. So, Velasquez was born to a Jewish father who was an attorney. Does that ring a bell, Bob? Attorney, Mr. Marish? <laughs> yes. Um, his father was converted to Catholicism. And you have to think about Velasquez's dad going, well, I, it's either this or... Probably, I've got, to, I've got to protect my family. I can keep my home. I won't be convicted and ex exiled out of the country. Or, or tortured and maybe killed because the kids need me. 
I'm sure these are the things that went through their heads. However, our first Jewish grandmaster painter, who has been called the most gifted and famous of all time, lived in the most extreme anti-Semitism. Imagine him living amongst all of this, and then now imagine what he's going to accomplish in his life. Can I have the uh, slide of um, the nitwit king, the King Philip IV? There we are. Now, <clears throat> as you all know, uh, this is King Philip IV. Well, you don't know that part, but what you do know is that he was a Habsburg. The Habsburgs all intermarried and interbred, as you well know, their cousins, uh, grandfathers married their granddaughters, uh, uncles married nieces, uh, cousins. It, it was just a dreadful, horrible hairball. And they, of course, turned into a bunch of netwits. And this is a perfect example. If you look at this man's face, you can see that he has this very pronounced chin. And his chin would, the, the, later on, they kept breeding this inner breeding, and their chins grew out like this to the point where they had to be fed by servants. They couldn't even eat. And they're, you know, and they were, they, they were crazy. Uh, they, they had terrible uh, physical deformities. And uh, however, this is a painting by Velasquez of Philip. They are also three other paintings of this same fellow throughout his life. And let me tell you, they, all look about the same. <laughs> um, the, he, he painted, well, as I told you, he became the royal court painter. He was the only one in, in the court painting. He also painted the Catholic Pope. As you, as you notice, this is a, paint, a painting of <clears throat> Pope Innocent the Tomb. Wasn't so innocent. Yeah, <laughs> you should know. Uh, he painted this painting, P.S., by the way, hangs in the Vatican to this day and is said to be the best, the most wonderfully rendered painting of a pope in the Vatican. And it, it is just extraordinary. And if you could examine these paintings close up, you would see what I'm talking about. And again, this is a Velasquez picture. Now, are we going to take a, a, a are we going to take a tour to the Vatican? <laughs> you you better than me. Send me a postcard. <laughs> um, I don't think they let me in there. <laughs> um, the, the next painting I want to show you by Velasquez is going to take some explaining. So let's put that up as large as I can get it on, on that screen. This painting is revolutionary for its time. And the reason it's so revolutionary is because it shows Velasquez painting a scene. And at first, when you look at this painting, you don't think of, well, what is he painting? What is this, what is this artist painting? Well, you don't see what he's painting because you're in the scene with the painter and he's chosen to paint that. He's chosen to paint the little princess, which you see right in the front. She's the main character. Uh, the king and queen, uh, again, because they had all of this inbreeding, they had had five children, 
so given five birth birth to five children who didn't live. This little girl lived. She's at the age, as you can see now, where she's maybe five to seven years old. She's pictured with her little maid servants and her dwarf, which was a common thing in that day to have a dwarf. So this was her dwarf, which was, you know, treated like a dolly or something. And then in the very back of the painting, which I, you probably can't see, there's a mirror. And in that mirror is a reflection of the king and the queen. And then you realize, only then do you realize that she's, that Velasquez is painting the king and queen, and he's surrounded by all of this activity that you see in the painting. Did I did did you understand that, Bob? Was that clear enough? Well, I I, I did understand it. I mean, it's very hard to see. It, it, it is. Now, all were all these family members, did they all look like Jay Leno? <laughs> Most, yes. <laughs> Maybe a distant relative. Oh no, it was worse. They, uh, some of them just really couldn't even function anymore. It's, it's a dreadful story. And, and it, it goes on even to this day. I'm, it's, uh, well, uh, let me just go on. Yeah. Velasquez uh, painted, as you can see, he painted royalty. He painted this huge this is by the way all of these paintings by the way are huge they're huge paintings this is a huge painting uh, Velasquez painted royalty he became the court painter he painted the Catholic Pope when he was invited to Rome he painted a famous portrait of his manservant who was a Moorish uh, man and who was a man of color, beautiful portrait of his manservant. And the portrait of his manservant is as tender and loving as you can imagine. It's a lovely portrait. Uh, he and he painted people in the kitchen frying eggs and the eggs are so filled with life that you look like you could you, reach in and have a bite, you know? Uh, and of course, Las Minas, which is quote, the maids, uh, revolutionized painting because nothing like this had ever been attempted before. This was an intellectual application of extraordinary skills. And I don't know how much it's been done in this since then. Uh, Velasquez lived only 61 years. He died when he was 61 years old. However, his brilliant diversity of composition, of form, space, atmosphere, lighting, brush strokes, color, all of these things that he did were approached in a, a different way. He's also the chief forerunner of the French Impressionists. He, because the French Impressionists looked to his skills to come up with the new things they invented. And this is pretty good, I would say, for a little Jewish boy from Seville who, who was not supposed to even be here if they'd have known uh, that he was Jewish. Uh, it's just, it just goes to show you, uh, well, you know, we can all talk about that. That's another whole program. But uh, it, it never- a program as opposed to a program. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, but you, you, you just can't imagine 
the in, the insanity. I'm always touched by this because it is always there in some form or another. And it, it's we can only hope that uh, the evils that are these kinds of uh, religious dogma, uh, it, people will get smart. Uh, because it really is evil uh, and holds us back, I believe. Um, these are just four of the Baroque artists. I haven't even talked to you about Rembrandt or Vermeer. And the, there, there were many, many more artists in this time period or that grew out of this time period from all of this revolutionary thinking. And we'll cover more of those in future programs. But I'm, I was just, it took a long, long time to research the, what uh, we've been looking at today. But I think it's important for us to get a grip on this stuff and take a look at who we were, because I think that if we look at who we were, we kind of know who we are uh, somehow, and that we've grown out of it as well. Uh, and there's great gloriousness in these paintings. Um, so I would like to thank um, my brainiac friends for helping me. Uh, which would be Bob Marish, my producer, uh, uh, Mark Rydell, which he teaches me how to speak, and Rob uh, and Richard Taylor, uh, who helps me out in times when I have anxiety attacks to get to all of this information. So I really do appreciate it. And, and, M and MJ. Oh, yes. And MJ, who I could not, I couldn't even do the show without Mary Jane. Uh, as a matter of fact, Mary Jane is going to come over and visit me in my cage on Friday. <laughs> so anyway, everyone, that's it for this week. And uh Whatever, you know, whatever anybody has to say, bring it. That was wonderful. Thank you. Bob, MJ, Aline. Aline, can you tell us any more, totally different subject, but right behind you is a painting. Are you gonna oh, yeah. talk about that at some point? Oh, I'll we'll talk about it right now. We have a few minutes. We do, yeah. Uh, this, can you see it? Can you see? Can you see this painting? That's well, better. Most of it. Yeah. Uh, this is a painting. I decided that I want to do a whole series of paintings about MPTF and uh, the wonderful, wonderful, magical people that live here and work here. This is the first one I bit off, and I'm about oh two thirds finished. There's this whole area. This will also get some nice green artichokes down at the bottom. Uh, but this is the, our uh, executive chef, Dan. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah. Recognize him. And this is Albert, uh, one of our fellows who works along with him in our on our kitchen staff. So these two boys... Uh, I've been working on them in an environment of the, the kitchen. And my main objective here was I've been trying to paint the color of heat in a kitchen. So that's the, the reason for the color that you're seeing here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's been quite a challenge, but it's been interesting, an interesting learning experience as well, to place these two fellows in the environment that's a challenge to even be in. 
uh, this environment. If you think about it, that's not an easy job. And the, the steam working over those steam tables and the fires out back there, it's it's hard, tough work. And and they're wonderful. You always see them. They're always smiling and lovely and uh, both of them, lovely men. So that was my first choice. My next one, if I can get to it, is I'm going to be painting the garden, which is right outside the door of my studio. Uh, and I'm going to be painting uh, Michelle and Judy with their bottoms in the air, tending to their flowers. <laughs> Oh, with the flowers. <laughs> uh, so that should be an uh, interesting endeavor. Have they signed off on this? Uh, they will. <laughs> they will. They will. They we'll will. get residuals from all yes, the friends. That's right. uh, well, uh, both Albert and Dan, I had no trouble roping them in to sit for me. Both of them have come by and allowed me to photograph them and they they came by and they sat for me, uh, both of them, and they've been very very accommodating, and I appreciate their help because I of course couldn't do it unless they let me. <laughs> right. Well, that looks great. I know them both, Albert and Dan. It's a really beautiful painting. So, Thank you. bravo. Oh, good. Well, we'll see. I'll I'll show it to you when it's finished because it's. Okay. it's it's only, it's, it's still in process. Okay. Anybody with any questions out there? You can, I mean, I'll try to answer it. Why did the Pope look so upset? <laughs> That's a crap. Okay, Marish. <laughs> he deserved to look upset. <laughs> he was a upset. vile guy. Yeah. Well, the reason okay give me one second oh, Corinne, let oh. me put you on uh, okay we have a real actual phone call oh good go, go ahead corinne yes uh, uh, not an actual person it's just corinne <laughs> uh, but uh, excuse now, me excuse uh, me go ahead go ahead now corinne. i have to run and turn down my television excuse me okay by the way i studied the maids aline in school Yes. I remember I, I remember learning oh, about that so and why much. it was so important. They're bringing my laundry at this point. Uh, oh, yes. I love that, that was feature. very interesting, Aileen. But, you know, I just, uh, I thought it was so interesting about the little princess. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing that painting, like, all my life. This one, you know, they show that, you know, mm -hmm. famous paintings. I wonder if you knew anything more about the lovely little princess. Did she ever grow to be queen or anything what if you know in that fabulous gown when she's like five years I old oh isn't that cute uh i have no clue uh, <laughs> i i'm <laughs> uh -huh. my I problem hope she didn't is, have the I'm, i hope she didn't have the chin the facial structure you were talking <laughs> yes, about she actually does if you could see the real painting have you ever seen the real painting corinne i wonder I want to tell you that I don't involve myself with the people in the paintings. I don't give a damn who they are. I just give, I really care about what shape their eyeballs are, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, what color, is, how many folds are in that gown that he's, he has on? Are they realistic? Where do, where's, the, where's his light source? You know, those are the kind of things. As a as a as a painter, uh, I, I don't care who I'm painting. You can bring a gourd in here or a person; it doesn't make that much difference. Right. Uh, when you're well, you're an artist. Painting. Yes. What? You're an artist, so uh, you see things well, like that. I I I, I, I want I, to know uh, what they're really like. Yeah. Oh, you know that. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Those people are nitwits. <laughs> you that I do know that much from studying them, and uh, you know that's not particularly kind. They didn't ask to no. get into this. I I feel no, sorry. No, well, for I didn't them, like actually. to think that the little princess is a nitwit. 
because she looks so exquisite. Anyway, uh, I know. Thank Isn't you. She I'll sweet. watch you next She's week. She's very sweet looking. Bye. What did you say, Marish? I say I don't. I, I don't feel sorry for him. Oh, you're just a toad. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. Oh, Thanks, Bob. Oh, uh, hello, hello. Okay. Good Thank show. You. Great Thanks show. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thank you.